Welcome to the keynote stage. So my name is Mark Walsh. I'm the founder of this conference and part of the leadership team with Daniela and Manel. We have got quite a feast, quite a treat installed for you. The main stage doesn't have all the top names on. Some of them are spread out for various logistical reasons, but there are some awesome presenters on this stage. This stage is also sponsored by Alain Stefani. When we first had the idea of getting sponsors, I basically said, I won't take anyone as a sponsor unless I love what they do, because otherwise it, it doesn't have any integrity for me. I didn't know who Alain Stefani was, but I met her in Berlin. Someone said, oh, she's an intimacy teacher, she's an ex-sex worker, best-selling author in Germany. And I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll meet her. And I met her, and as soon as I met her, I felt at ease. I felt like, wow, this is a person who's playful, but also a deep listener. This is a, a woman who's a real leader. Uh, since I've seen her work uh, with people in very, you know, around trauma, around intimacy, around very difficult areas, men and women, I've come to regard her as a friend, actually. Like, I love her. So go to her website and check it out. It's Alan, I-L-A-N, Stefani, S-T-E-P-H-A-N for November I, alanstefani.com. There's an offer there called Love and Rage, which is as juicy as it sounds. You'll also find links in the descriptions uh, for the videos below. So thank you to our sponsor. And uh, so tonight, Ruby Wax on the Embodiment Conference. Most of you will probably know, which is why there's so many people tuned in to this session with Ruby Wax, but just in case you don't know Ruby. So Ruby Wax is a successful comedian TV writer and performer with her own show on the BBC for over 25 years and the script writer of absolutely fabulous series. 10 years ago, her life changed direction and Ruby now holds a master's degree in mindfulness-based cognitive therapy from Oxford University and was awarded an OBE in 2015 for her services to mental health. She also set up the Frazzled Club, which is an amazing thing where people can go and meet and talk about what it's like to be alive and authentic in a community and I really love that and um, she's the author of a, a number of successful books um, a mindfulness guide to for the frazzled how to be a human with a monk and a neuroscientist and her much anticipated and now for the good news to the future with love which cuts through the overwhelming negative rhetoric that we're facing at the moment. So in looking at compassionate changes that are happening in the world in areas such as education, business, food technology, food and technology, these innovations and these innovators believe that will only thrive if we create a sense of community. So Ruby's gonna talk about this for the next 35 minutes or so, and then there'll be an opportunity for questions. So Ruby, over to you. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Um, I thought I'd start uh, telling you a little bit about myself. Well, not a little, actually, <laughs> a lot. So I worked for the BBC for 25 years doing my own shows. And um, in the end, uh, I interviewed Donald Trump. <laughs> so sorry. And uh, that then I decided I, um, well, you couldn't go on from there. I actually, I interviewed him. You can Google this and his private jet. And we were about, I'm not me, 35,000 feet. And he said to me, first thing he said, he said um, that he wanted to be president of the United States. So I started laughing. And he said, that's it, I want her off the plane, land it. So they immediately landed the plane and I ended up with my camera crew in Arkansas. Uh, we had no plans going there, but the whole show is looking for Donald who I do finally find, but you have to watch the rest to see what happens. So I interviewed many, many people and um, well, OJ Simpson was another one. Uh, if you Google that, he tried to, um, I don't know if I should say this, stab me with a banana at about four in the morning. That's in the show. I gave up then um, television. Uh, I thought I'd leave it before it leaves me. And I really wanted to retain what was left of my mind. So uh, I thought let's reinvent. Ruby, let's think of something. But coincidentally, at the same time, Comic Relief, do you know who, the, well, those in the UK, it's a charity. And they said, could I uh, pose for a picture for them? So I said, yeah, sure. But I thought it was gonna be a, like a, a tiny little photograph of me, but instead they put giant posters of me, giant, all the way down the tube station, the underground, one after the other. And it said on the poster, one in four people have mental illness 
one in five people have dandruff. I have both. So I didn't ask me, I just saw it there and I thought, oh, well, that's the end of my career. So what I thought I'm going to do is I'm going to um, write a show and I'm going to pretend that's the publicity poster. So I had to write a show and I did. I wrote about mental illness um, and I performed it because I was nervous. I didn't, still didn't want people to know that I had it. I was the one in four. So I performed it in, I'm not making this up, mental institutions for two years. And I think they liked it. I used to write my own reviews. I would say, the bipolars would say, I laughed, I cried. <laughs> but these were my people, so I could try it out on them. And then, uh, to my surprise, the show went out of the uh, institutions and it went to real theaters all the way around the world. Um, it went everywhere, to Australia, New Zealand, South America, uh, Cape Town, um, everywhere. And wherever I went, I, it, I did the first half of the show, then there would be an interval. And in the second half, I had the audience stand up and talk. And wherever I took this show, um, the audience would say the same thing. They would say that their lives were going at top speeds. They couldn't find any breaks, that they were burning out and that uh, they had these critical inner thoughts, you know, that they couldn't stop. I could have, I'm not good enough. I'm a failure. Everybody knows I'm gonna get caught. It was so similar to what I think. Cause at that time I never really, thought of, I never had a thought that said, uh, what a wonderful thing I'm doing. And may I say how attractive I am today. It never occurred to me that that was peculiar. So I thought I'm gonna write another show and it won't just be for the one in four, it'll be for the three in four who are frazzled, which is pretty much everybody. Um, let me explain what frazzled means. I didn't make that word up. It's a neurobiological word. It means basically stress about stress. See, we, we do the human package, we come with stress. Otherwise, we'd have no mojo. But a contemporary illness is now this stress about stress. We're anxious about our anxiety. And so we get these thoughts. I couldn't, I shouldn't be this stressed. Nobody else is this stressed. I've said, this is new. I mean, in the past, nobody died of stress. They didn't die. They died. Well, I mean, the times were hard. Spanish Inquisition wasn't fun. I mean, people, well, died with a spike through the head or they died of bad teeth or old age about 12 and a half, but nobody died of stress. But before I go on to explain a little bit about stress, uh, let me just say that it's our thoughts that are sabotaging our own mind. Our thinking, this is, an, is what's burning us out with these critical thoughts. Why are we so mean to ourselves? I mean, did we do something wrong? We have this magnificent piece of equipment on top of our heads. I mean, nothing is more complex. It makes the universe looked like um, a piece of Lego. And the same brain that can figure out how many light years it takes for us to see a twinkle knows nothing about itself. I mean, emotionally, we're still in the primordial mud. It, it's almost like we have a Ferrari on top of our heads, but nobody gave us the keys. I, I know evolution plays a part. I mean, you know, evolution really doesn't care about, it cares about our survival. It really couldn't give a hoot about our happiness. I know that, I know, but you know, all these years, we haven't figured it out. I mean, how to be happy. We'd never, I mean, if you wanna figure it out, each person has to, even in, in the beginning of time, they didn't know. That's why, if you don't believe me, if you go into a bookstore and go to the self-help section and look up all the books on how to be happy, the last one I saw was actually called um, How to Be Happy, Hug Your Inner Elf. I don't make these things up, anyway. If you lined, if you piled up all those self-help books on how to be happy, you could probably reach Mars. Haven't figured it out. So I'm gonna go back to stress. All right. In the past, we needed stress. There's no question. It was the perfect piece of equipment that we needed because if a predator came, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago, if a predator came along, um, we would get this, this amygdala, you all know what that is, it would activate and we'd be gushing with cortisol so we could either take them on or take off and then after the incident was over and we know the results because either we would lunch or we were having lunch so if we were still in existence right the amygdala would come down the cortisol would cool down we'd go back to the day job like animals they're fine you know they're chased by a lion they get away the next thing is they're grazing they're fine they don't need a psychiatrist they don't need antidepressants or crisis intervention 
they're fine. And we used to be like this, but now we're wired. We never calm down because we're, as you know, we're being bombarded by bad news. It's coming in everywhere, everywhere. And when one disaster ends, another one begins. I mean, so we're, we're just stressed stressed about stress to the max. I mean, we're always thinking, well, what's going to nix us next? It's going to be North Korea or too much salt. We can't, you know, our minds, our little amygdala, it can't tell if there's a threat behind us or something is happening 20,000 miles away. It can't tell the difference. I mean, I think as humans, we were only supposed to know what our neighbors were up to. You know, if the woman next door to me is maybe having sex with the man next door to her, I have to know that. But four doors down, it's not my business. Anyway, I'm being a little flip. But another part of our brain is that it's some of it is still very primitive. Okay, it's it's from 500,000 years, 400,000 years ago. And then, of course, we have a newer, more evolved brain. But this one didn't evaporate. We have these Stone Age brains that can't tell that the wallpapers changed. This is why we can't deal with the complexities of the 21st century and then too much choice. We can't deal with, remember it was just chocolate and vanilla and now, oh my, you go down a shopping center, you're going through different time zones. You need a visa to get into Zara's and all the shops are going, come on, buy me, buy me, buy me. It's just weapons of mass distraction. Buy me, buy me. I mean, shoppers are like junkies, really snorting up everything they will never need. As humans, we know how to deal with scarcity, but we do not know how to deal with abundance. That's why I don't want to be depressing, but more people are dying of obesity than they are of starvation. But I'm here for the good news. So back to me, back to me. Um, as I said, I was one of the one in four. Uh, so about 12 years ago, I was hit by the tsunami of all depressions. Uh, those of you who are the one will know it's your old personality suddenly leaves town and you're replaced by a block of cement. Uh, now you have to try to remember who you used to be, you know, and so when you meet people, you imitate who you think your personality is. I mean, it, and you really can't recall it. I mean, even to take a shower is incomprehensible. I mean, you can't, and now I'm sitting here, you just, you know, you can't make up your mind about anything. It's like, uh, do I uh, get a manicure or jump off a cliff? Eeny, meeny, doesn't matter. And I didn't want anybody to know because, you know, we, it's a thing of shame, you know, on top of everything else. That's the, we have to ladle it on with shame. <laughs> the only disease in town that really, you know, if I was uh, pregnant or I had broken a leg, I would have been inundated with cards. But um, all I got was a couple of phone calls from some friends who said, perk up. Yeah, perk up, because I didn't think of that. Anyway, um, I thought, okay, I'm gonna find some way to deal with this. I'd had it throughout my life, but 12 years ago, this was the final. It just lasted too long. I thought I'm gonna figure out something. Maybe there's no magic pill, but maybe some way I could, um, you know, hold, hold back those brutal blows that keep coming in. So I Googled everything. I looked on scientific journals. I read everything because I'm, maybe you don't know, I'm an obsessive person. And so I found out that at that time, cognitive therapy and mindfulness, I never heard of that, sounded way too vegetarian, but I looked it up. Those two seem to have, not 100%, but the most impressive results for depression, anxiety, ADHD, OCD, pretty much, and those, of course, who are frazzled. So I thought, well, how do I find this out? So I hunted down one of the founders of mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. They put the two together, and he was a a professor at Oxford. So I drove there, I still wasn't right. And I cornered him and I said, okay, I don't have a lot of time, you know, don't give me anything fluffy, but what happens in the brain, okay? Because I have really no time. You know, if I had some spare time, I'd take salsa. Just give it to me, you got 30 seconds. What happens in the brain if you practice these things? He said, no, he was a little um, arrogant, said, I'm sorry, if you wanna know what goes on in the brain, you'd have to get it into Oxford and get your master's. So I did, and nobody was as surprised as that man. Well, I wasn't very bright as a child. I know that'll surprise you, but I knew how to fail. And those of us that know how to fail, we know how to try again, because then we fail and we try again, because we're the ones that think out of the box. And those teachers didn't even know there is a box. 
but that's a separate story. Anyway, I was a late bloomer. This was about five years ago I graduated. Okay, late bloomer. So um, I learned about mindfulness and what I did then was um, for my dissertation, I did a show inst instead of doing a practical and uh, that's how I passed. So I then took that show and I upped it with comedy and then I took it on tour everywhere. Um, this wasn't the one about uh, depression. This one was now about neuroscience and evolution and mindfulness. So I took that, one of my shows was called um, How to Be Human with a Monk and a Neuroscientist. And um, I made them go on tour with me. That's not their job, but I watched them blossom until eventually they became impossible. Finding their light. No, I love them. The monk lives in my house actually, Gelan Tukten. And um, I love him. I always say, I asked him to live in my house because he matches my sofa. But that's not really the reason. I love him. Who wouldn't want a monk in their, in their home? So, um, I didn't want to go um, you know, down the road of depression, but I'll tell you something, mindfulness really does deliver what it says on the 10, because now when I do have depression coming, I haven't had it for 12 years, but I can feel it in my body. Because one thing mindfulness does, it's a barometer for you to be able to tell what are the weather conditions inside. If I didn't even know I had a body before. You know, it was just an irritating piece of skin I carried around under my neck. You know, it's like carrying your head in a shopping cart. But now, you know, you could really check in and then see, I could feel when the depression was on the horizon. It, it's sort of like animals when they hear that there's an earthquake coming. And if you know something's happening, about to happen, you could do something about it. Because in the past, you're so horrified that this beast is coming that you start going to dinner parties where you don't know anybody. And, you know, to show the world you're fine is again, there's shame involved. So what I did, I can feel it coming. And you can feel it in my everywhere. I can feel the heaviness. Even my hair has a different quality when I get depressed. And of course, the eyes go dead. And I can feel that depression isn't sadness. So it's, it's death. It's nothingness. So I can feel it. And then what I do is I shut down everything social media because I take it seriously. I checked in a retreat last time, a silent retreat, and it's just as agonizing as you think. It is the most agonizing pain on earth, but it passed much quicker because I didn't get depressed about being depressed. So it was five days rather than the usual five months. And I could feel there is depression, but I'm not depressed. My knee wasn't depressed. I could feel it in my body and then I could feel when it was leaving. Um, mindfulness is the greatest barometer there is for um, finding out what your inner state is because if the mind is riled, it will ruminate till you drop. It'll just keep going. But when you focus in on the body, it's, it's not gonna keep, you're just gonna focus in on the body and whatever you are focused in, you're in the present because you can't, for example, I don't know, you can't touch something tomorrow or last week. <clears throat> it's always now. And that really, <laughs> the cortisol is down when you're now. It's the future and past thinking that riles you up again. Now, um, then you start applying that feeling of that bodily awareness to thoughts. So you learn to relate to them that they're not solid. They're like a, a, a feeling, they come and go of their own volition. Some are nice, some are mean. Some are pornographic, some are adorable. They just keep rolling unless you jump in on them. If you don't buy in, they really are like a radio in another room. I mean, I don't have it down. I mean, still in the foothills, but sometimes I hear the CD of, oh, you're a failure or nobody's listening to this. That I sort of, you know, I, who knows who wrote the script, but I just sort of think, oh yeah, that's that old CD number 27 and that's 45. So I'm not so... It loses its sting. Anyway, I, just a little bit more about mindfulness because it's my passion, but on a science level, what I love about it <clears throat> is that when you're aroused, you know, as I said, the amygdala is activated, which is most of our lives. We live in that state of that cortisol gushing. But when you so, send your focus to a sense, you know what they are, sight, sound, taste, touch, a feeling in the body, Immediately, another part, I'm making it simple, 
if there's a neuroscientist out there, I'm so sorry, um, but your books are too confusing. So when you're aware of a bodily sense, there's another part of your brain activated called the insula. Okay, now you can't have the gabbling rumination, the amygdala aroused at the same time as the insula is. It's one or another. You know, it's like being in a car, you can't be in two gears at once. So, um, you know, so basically what you do is you notice the thinking and then if you can take your focus and you learn, it's like doing a sit up in a gym, you learn, it gets easier. And you, but you have to practice, you don't get a six pack with one sit up. So if you go back to the sense, okay, you won't stay in sense mode. Otherwise it would take you 200 years to brush your teeth. The, the front, the thoughts will always come. I mean, we're thinking creatures. Thoughts will come, you pull it back to the insula. Thoughts will take you, you take it back, activate the insula to the bodily sensation. And eventually that insula, like a muscle, gets more and more neural connections, it gets buff and strong. So actually when the, the stress starts really hitting you in the face, you can dodge some of those mental bullets. And this isn't a hundred percent, it's not for everybody, but I wouldn't be doing it if it, life wasn't a little bit easier. So um, should we do it for a second? All right, I can't see you, but we'll do it. So we'll do mindfulness. All right. So moving away from the back of the chair, if you can, if that's comfortable and putting your feet on the ground, both feet, so you feel the floor, neck just balanced on the top of your neck and then eyes open or shut, that's up to you. Shoulders relaxed and taking the focus as far away from this gabbling brain as possible. So that would be feeling your feet where they make contact with the floor. So really, just feeling the whole footprint of both feet, their weight on the ground. From the front to the back, side to side, sending the focus just as much as you can sense that floor. And then let go of that image and bring your focus to where you feel yourself making contact with whatever you're sitting on, the chair or the sofa. So you just feel the effect of gravity pulling you down, wherever you can feel it. It could be back of your thighs, bottom of your pelvis, just your weight. And then let that go, let it go. And then now bring your focus to, well, it's a sense, sound. So all you do is listen. From right ear, left, front, behind, just let the sound come to you. And then you'll, there'll be a moment or a second that a thought will come in and snare you. It has to come. This is human. It has to come. Maybe you like the sound. You don't like the sound. You're thinking what's going to go on. You'll notice that maybe not a thought, but you'll be pulled off piece and you're not listening anymore. But the thing with mindfulness is that's supposed to happen. That's the nature of the beast. But here's the other thing. Don't be hard on yourself. We're hard enough. You just take your focus, like you're doing a sit up, just take it and bring it gently back to listening. And they'll take you away a thousand times. You know, it will take you, that's guaranteed. And you just really nicely, if you haven't done anything wrong, go back to the sound. Now, just we'll finish, let go of the sound. And the same way you focused on sound, bring your attention to where you feel the breath most vivid in your body. So your tip of your nose, chest, throat, abdomen, just zoom in and see if you can feel the air going in and going out, how deep it is and how frequent. And then noticing that you're not breathing anymore, so the thoughts must have come, but that's okay. Just come back to the breath. And see if you can count five breaths. And if you don't make it, it doesn't matter. It's not a contest, but just 
just to play with it. So in, out is one. Okay, well, you can open your eyes if you had them shut. But let, let me just say something, because sometimes people think that mindfulness is kind of, um, you know, you're in your cocoon of self-absorption, you know, that, you know, it's, uh, it's about being just aware of yourself, but, you know, or sitting on your gluten-free cushion. But the point of mindfulness really is if you can pull down that cortisol, you know, get the red mist down, not in a cruel way, but just learning to regulate your emotions is that you can finally pass that feeling onto the next person because we work like neural Wi-Fi. I love that expression is that if I can cool it, cool it down, I pass it. We're like, a, humans are like ripple effects, you know, we, how we affect each other. I pass it to my kids, kids pass it to their friends, friends to the community, community to the city, city to the planet. You know, I always say, fix yourself and then go save the world. Because otherwise it's like you're carrying a grenade and someday it's gonna detonate and you might spread your problems over everybody else. But that's the point of mindfulness, I think. You know, we always blame everything. Uh, you know, it's it's this, it's this, it's this politics, whatever. But the bully isn't out there, it's in here. The problem isn't out there. It's in here, inside of our minds, there will always be war until we declare a truce in our own brains. That's my speech on world peace. Anyway, another reason um, to practice mindfulness is, um, and it doesn't have to be mindfulness, there's other physical exercises, but I happen to be trained in mindfulness. They weren't, that's what they taught at Oxford. So I don't know about the other things, but there are physical like Tai Chi and yoga, but anything that pulls you back into your body, you notice, go in the body, of course, the thoughts will come, but come back inside. I mean, we're talking about embodiment. I don't know a better way of, unless you're naturally embodied. I wasn't though. You know, if you can pay attention to somebody else, you can only pay attention to somebody else if you lower your own red mist. Otherwise you can't really hear them. You're full of fear and, you know, it does become self-indulgent. But if you can lower your you know, the, the fear fog, you can really hear what other people are saying. And that's human connection is the ultimate. We can only do that if we, if we cool this down, because then you can really feel your body can pick up what their body feels. And this is, you know, going into their minds and seeing how they see the world. And if you can give somebody your attention, it's the most flattering thing you can do on earth. That's the ultimate gift to give somebody your, your attention. We think we pay attention, but we really don't. As I said, there are weapons of mass distraction pulling it, but again, it's a trainable thing. It's exercising another part of the brain, but I won't go into that, we haven't got time. Um, but the other thing that happens is when you realize uh, that, you know, that there's a clarity in your brain, you can start to give yourself compassion for those, those thoughts that are attacking you, you know, and you can only give compassion to somebody else if you feel compassion for yourself. So when somebody's slinging their rage at me, you know, flipping their rage, sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes if I can calm myself down, and then of course they calm down, they can't, you know, you can't throw a tennis ball at something that's not throwing it back. But then I can start to figure wait a minute, maybe they have a loop tape of critical thought thinking in their brains too. So I don't take it so personally. And again, compassion is also a virus. We pass it to each other. I wanna just say that um, it's hard for me to do because my drug of choice used to be rage. I really, you know, nothing feels that good. We always get addicted to things that are bad for us. I mean, nobody gets addicted to kale, but um, I used to love it. I would find somebody, you know, usually not somebody I knew, but like a traffic warden and I would give it to them. Of course, the next day I had the hangover, you know, cause the bile goes back down and they probably thought, well, I met a crazy person. Now my latest book is called, uh, and now for the good news to the future with love. And I wrote it because I was overdosing. As I say, I finished it, the uh, night lockdown started. So I worked on it for the last two or three years and I was sick of, um, being a victim of all this constant talk about what's the, you know, and 
again, it's toxic. I don't even watch some of the news, but it comes through my walls. And I know that where we pay, put our attention defines kind of who we are. It becomes, you know, we start to only get focused on things that, how do I say it, that give us a sense of identity. I mean, I know they put um, at one point electrodes or something on women who identify themselves as being victims and send them into a party and they kept going straight for the perpetrator. I mean, we really, it's a, a human glitch. You know, we'll, even if it's, a, you know, it's the devil we know, you might be attracted to people who aren't good for your health, but that's how you identify. I mean, we are, we're trapped by our own identities, you know, caged by our <laughs> idea of who we are. But again, that's another story. So I know where you put pay attention becomes what you are. And I didn't want to just be a massive um, terror. So I thought, throw your attention intentionally to something positive. So I went around the globe and I found people in different areas who were, I call them the green shoots of um, the innovators who are working on they're, they're reinventing the wheel as far as education, community, business, tech, health. And uh, I did go around and I found the people that were, if we really pay attention to what they're doing and nurture it, we could really grow ourselves a more help, hopeful future. So for example, I went to Finland, I looked at how they teach kids. Well, I mean, that's off the chart. I, I met the minister of education. He said, we don't want a Nobel prize winner or somebody who was the CEO. We just want people to feel safe. And, um, and they work as a team, these kids. You know, they have pride that they're pulling up another kid who may not be good at the subject. And I went to a few schools in, in the UK and there's a couple in really disadvantaged neighborhoods. And these kids, you know, come from homes that you can see that these kids are traumatized. So I went to the school and they were teaching the kids empathy. And we went in a circle and had to tell each other what we appreciated about each other. And um, it's, you know, it's just breathtaking. And the kids were taught there's no such thing as a stupid question. So imagine how I would have flourished. I mean, it's unbelievable that these kids, um, you know, these are gonna be the people who think out of the box. And empathy is gonna be the ticket in 20 years. There won't be a job left that exists now. So I'm sure if you understand conflict resolution or you know feeling what other people feel, that's gonna be the gold standard. Anyway, at the end, the kids all got together and sang that song to me about 600 of these kids that you could tell came from broken homes and they had ways to self-regulate what I'm talking about. Not only mindfulness, but they'd know when they were in a state of high alarm, you know, their amygdala hijack. So they'd leave the classroom and go to a wall where there was red, a yellow, green, and they'd identify where they were. So if they were in the red zone, they had breathing balls that they play with or um, a jar that had glitter in it that they'd shake. And as the glitter went to the ground, they would use their um, images, their mind settling down or it was just remarkable. Then they go back and take the exam and the, their results are pretty amazing. So by hot housing, a kid won't necessarily grow you a, you know, a well-adjusted person. I don't wanna go into that, but you know, we are burning these kids' brains out. Anyway, at the end, they all sang A Million Miles, that song, which I can't stand. And I don't cry much, but <laughs> I wept. That was, and then of course I went to Patagonia and Business, which is a sportswear shop. Well they've been doing for 40 years. Everybody works for an em environmental cause and that's part of their salary. They're fair all the way down the supply chain and there's other companies now, but they work as teams. They work together. They don't have to keep going to the boss. They're trusted. And so they work actually for a purpose more than profit, but their profit is that they quadruple every year. So it, I'm telling you, business has to now learn to work like that because soon there's going to be an app where we can tell if somebody's exploited somebody you know we put it over the clothes and you can tell if how old the kid was who sewed the zipper into your jeans and then goodbye company so they should be aware but also community there are intentional communities now there's about ten thousand of them under the banner of gen which is global eco network and i'm in one of them now i'm because i wanted to walk the talk of my book i'm in Findhorn and I, I pick the vegetables every day and they go to the food bank um, 
And I wanted to be with people who smile at me when I go by and don't ask me what I do as if the definition of me is what I do for a living. So, you know, I, I am there. Uh, anyway, then I do frazzled. I have a frazzled, it's called frazzled cafe where I talk to about a hundred people live three times a week and they're from all demographics and they speak from the heart. Now that's community. So that's all I can do, but I know this interconnectedness has to stay. And it's, strangely, it's on tech, which we all used to criticize, but we finally are focusing on each other and compassion just oozes off the screen because people just want to be heard. I have people who say, oh, I never knew I mattered, but now I know I exist. And there is, your heart just opens. So I do the please come to frazzlecafe.org. It's free. I'm there. And then there's people during the day who can take smaller groups. Anyway, um, just to finish, you know, I think we've evolved far enough. Uh, you know, we have our full quote of thumbs and we don't <clears throat> need to go any faster. Thank you to Uber. But um, if we're really going to survive the future, you know, to be able to navigate the chaos, we're going to have to upgrade our minds as much as we've upgraded our iPhones. And I really hope it'll be less about survival of the fittest, but more about survival of the wisest. So thank you. Thank you. I'll do question and answer now. So thank you for that, Ruby. That was, uh, it was delightful to see, it was infectious to see your warmth and love as you talked about the kids in the school. So that, uh, as you say, compassion is a virus that we can catch and you can actually catch it through the screen as well. So, so thank you for that. So uh, we've got a few, a few questions. <clears throat> so the uh, first question or the most popular question is what advice would you give about mindfulness to a teenager who is reluctant to do it? I did write a book about it in Mindfulness Guide for the Frazzled. <laughs> I'm not selling my books, but it's in the Mindfulness Guide. Uh, there's a whole section on what to do with um, kids and then teenagers. And I, I stole most of it from at Oxford Mindfulness um, School. They have dot B and they have it for young kids, what to do to help them self-regulate. They don't call it mindfulness. There's games you play. And with the teenager, really, let me just say, if the parent doesn't do it, you have to walk the talk again. The kid will see that you've cooled your, the worst thing is, is you tell you're, you're in a state of agitation and then you tell, why would they want to be like you? But if you can hold down, if you can hold that redness, you can hear your kid. It may kill you, you know, but the more you practice, you can hear and then have some empathy to say, yeah, I felt that way too when I was 10. Yeah, I was kind of a failure. My kids love when I tell them how much of a failure I was. I don't say in my day, they're much cooler than I am. I'm an idiot compared to them. But I think unless we can lower that, it always comes back to that. There's no bond. Humans only bond when we got that oxytocin pouring out of us. So, I mean, I, I can give examples of what to save your kids in certain situations. You can't let them run free, but boundaries have to be done with compassion. Thank you. Uh, so another question is, um, we've heard something of your history of experience of mental health difficulties and depression. Can you say something about what it's been like integrating these experiences with mindfulness and wellness uh, into your sense of self now and what's different now than from before? Well, I, um, I haven't had a depression for 12 years. I can feel them coming, right? And tomorrow I'll have one and I'll have to blame you. But um, I really did just practice mindfulness. There's other reasons to practice it. I needed, um, I, I do do medication by the way, but I also do mindfulness because if medication worked, we wouldn't have relapses. So when I'm in the trough, I don't go, you know, I wouldn't do mindfulness. I haven't had it that deeply because there's no mind. But when I'm not, I have to get that insula, that I have to buff up my brain so that I'm ready for it. But there is no magic pill. But I, in my case, and it won't work with everybody, I'm ready for it. It's still coming. It hasn't come yet, a severe one. But I, you know, I'm, I'm not ashamed of it. That takes a load off your mind.
Oh, I can't hear you. Thanks. Your comment on physical illness being more acceptable than mental illness. Do you think that's changed since you experienced it? And uh, how do you think we can improve that in the future? Well, to me, I'm really practical. If you have a disability, maybe I'm off, but in a business and they fire, you can take them to court. But if you have a mental illness and you find yourself out of a job, strangely, you can't take them to court. So um, those things have to change. And again, I advise people in their company to, to find, find your people. You know, there, there's people like you. I mean, that's when you feel, I always think talking is half the cure. Um, if you're brave enough and you're a community, you can take on somebody who's trying to <laughs> fire you. You know, it's power. And once you, I've done this in front with construction workers once who were building the tube and had them do mindfulness. And eventually one guy, you know, these guys don't talk about it, said he was thinking of suicide, but one of his friends stopped him. And these guys don't talk from the heart, but they all applauded him. And I really, I know that he's gonna be just surrounded with love now. So if you're in a business, meet other people in your situation. Thank you. Um, what is your favorite brief technique of mindfulness that somebody can do anywhere? What do you What do you do, generally, day to day? You know, I do it. I do the you know following. I mean the the breath and sound and feet on the ground and eventually you start to watch and you go into your body, you know, and see where there's emotional or physical pain. That's what John Kabat-Zinn started the mindfulness-based stress reduction. And when you really focus, it's counterintuitive. You realize that it's not solid. Even extreme pain, it starts to shift a little bit. It doesn't go away, but it's, it, it moves. So you're, you can feel the rest of your body is okay instead of tensing it up. But um, I tell people, even if they do a minute a day, uh, there's shifts in the brain. And uh, so I sometimes say, if you're drinking coffee or something, taste it and then watch where your mind goes blah blah I shouldn't be doing this oh I have a thousand things did I but remember to buy a cat flap all that you haven't done anything wrong but just take it back to tasting the coffee again just for one minute it's like it's a mental sit-up you think if you never saw somebody do a sit-up why are they lying down and getting up again so get ready for the brain being exercised yeah so uh, another question here why do we know that we aren't our thoughts, or as you put it, that our thoughts sabotage our own minds and yet still persist with such destructive thoughts? Why is self-sabotage so seductive and what is the way out? Well, I think it's Rick Hansen who's been on, I think he was on here, or it was uh, everybody's been on here. Um, he said that f out of five thoughts, four are negative that were Velcro for, um, uh, negative thoughts and Teflon for positive ones. Yeah, that's and, Rick Hansen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he, I, and the reason is, I mean, don't blame yourself. It's in the past hundreds of thousands of years ago, we were perfectly adjusted back then. It's just really, you know, technologically we're whiz kids, but we don't know how to, we can't keep up emotionally with what we've created. But, you know, back in those days, we had to be on our toes to think what's a snake, what's a stick really quickly, you know, we'd flip from thought to thought. It was kind of like an animal is always looking around, but then they calm down when there's nothing there. Once language came in, this is just my interpretation, rather than just being aroused, we're thinking, oh my God, I'm gonna get caught. Nobody's gonna, um, everybody's gonna think I'm a failure. In a way we've replaced the feelings with the recordings. If you took the recordings away, you have to be on your toes. You know, if somebody mugs you, if you have a big smile, good luck. But um, it's, it's constantly trying to put words to those feelings. That's what I think destroys us. You know, sometimes, you know, you're just aroused or you're angry, but you don't have to engage in it. Oh, oh God, I, why am I angry? Now I'm going to kill the person. I'm going to call my husband and talk about how angry I am. It's bad for us, but that those negative Emotions are very seductive because they taste so good. Adrenaline is delicious. Dopamine is like having 80 cigarettes. But, you know, unfortunately, we've got a problem. We're too dopamine driven. 
I don't have the answers. I mean, I am in the foothills of this. I will buy shoes at three in the morning if they show me the right picture. So that uh, leads nicely into this next question. Somebody was wondering about your journey into self-healing and has it affected your comedic side? Uh, sometimes, though, not always, the connection between trauma and comedy or uh, yeah, trauma and comedy as a fine coping line. So, uh, but you still seem to be, your sense of humor still seems vibrant. So I'm curious about that. Well, if I was depressed, I wouldn't be, you know, you would notice something. I'm not depressed. I mean, that's why people think it's an active imagination because I haven't always got it. Um, and I happen to be fun, you know, it's not comedians don't all have depression. I mean, one in four people aren't that funny. But um, I think that the trauma thing is when I used to uh, come from America and my parents were, would devastate me. That's why I went to Europe so quickly. I would get off the, um, I get off the bus from Heathrow and I go to uh, my friend's house and I would do a monologue about what happened at home. It, he said it was like watching somebody in Vegas, but it was me hurling the rage so quickly. It was Alan Rickman actually. And he eventually said, write down what you're saying because you're really funny. And those became shows. But it was out of, it, if I hadn't gotten it out, it would have been frozen inside. So I was blessed. I, I'm telling you, the way I grew up, I could have been a serial killer or a comedian. Well, thank goodness you're a comedian. <laughs> Wouldn't so. be sitting here, would I? <laughs> yeah. And I'm wondering whether, uh, do you have to, when you, you know, your sofa, you've had it for a few years now, whether you continue to, will you change the, the monk or will you change this, keep getting a new sofa of the same color? Um, yeah, well, he, I'm trying to get him to do a brighter, more, you know, a lipstick colored red and he just won't do that for me so he doesn't completely match it that i love him so much yeah and when i i and i won't even go into it he's he's wonderful so we're coming to the end of our time uh, is there any i'm curious about do your kids find you funny no, my kids, I, I'm an embarrassment. My daughters are comedians, they're called siblings, and I'm not allowed to even see their show because I know nothing. I'm, I know nothing. So, no, they don't think I'm funny. I'm embarrassing. I'm sorry to hear that. So you were yeah. talking about teenagers earlier on, and I, I don't know whether you're, are you familiar with Dan Siegel's work? Um, oh, yes, you do, you are, actually. The, no, no, I actually, I, I know the answer to that because the first time I saw you uh, was at Dan Siegel's conference on why psychotherapy works. You were sat in the row in front of me, in the seat in front of me. So, uh, so yes, yeah. you do know about his work, I, but I've I was thinking. Him. About, yeah. I've stalked him. <laughs> <laughs> I can understand that. <laughs> so uh, I'm wondering whether you've read his book on the teenage brain. Yep. One. I stole everything in my book, but uh -huh. he, he wrote me a great review. Uh -huh. I, I kind of take what people say and then I twist it into comedy, which yeah. I think that translates to people like me who have a very confused mind. Uh -huh. But Daniel's a, real, a genius. Mind sight. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. I particularly liked uh, the uh, brainstorm, you know, the power yeah, and purpose of the teenage brain. So the person who asked the question about teenagers, that would probably be a good book to, yeah. to follow up. And, uh, but his developing mind book, uh, I think is a work of genius. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, anything else, Ruby? Anything you've- Yeah, Dan, Daniel's a genius, but let's, let's talk about, <laughs> let's talk about you. No, do, are there any other questions? So, uh, <clears throat> So one of the questions is, where can I get a monk for my home? Right. Well, I'm selling them as small, well, in small salt and pepper size shakers. I've made, took them and isn't it? It's going to be like, everybody's going to want one instead of, you know, a scented candle. It's going to be monks. Rem let me remind you, that's the next big thing. Anyway, Ruby, we're coming to the end of our time. It's been delightful to, uh, to meet you. 
and to uh, to experience. I, for me, it was really your something of your warmth comes through in how you speak, as well as the kind of the, the wisdom that you've kind of managed to um, take in and uh, share in such an eloquent and digestible form. So anyway, so final announcements. Um, oh, so the sorry, can I just say, if anybody would like to come to Frazzled Cafes, um, I, do, I do them Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, mm -hmm. from, and people are from all countries, but you go on frazzledcafe.org, and it's a meeting of, well, everybody, it's human. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's a meeting of human beings. I did have that down in my notes to say, so visit the Frazzled Cafe. The other thing is to uh, check out your books which are, uh, you know, uh, excellent, very, very readable. And now for the good news. Yeah. So uh, the next session that we move to after this is the closing, uh, the closing session of this conference. The conference has been going on for 12 days now. And as Ruby said, we've had pretty much everybody here. So it's great to, to, to bookend it with somebody with uh, Ruby's warmth and uh, eloquence in communicating this. So thank you, Ruby. Um, thank you. So the conference is, uh, it comes to an end tonight. Do join us at the closing ceremony. And uh, do think about buying the conference. So you can, uh, I think um, my tech host will put up something about where you can find the, uh, how to buy it. It does help the, you know, the amount of work that's gone on in putting this conference on, if you can imagine nearly, a th well, a thousand channels, a thousand talks over 12 days. I don't think anybody has been able to watch them all. So do think about investing. That helps get something of a return. And uh, you'll be able to watch them at your leisure and learn from some of the greatest teachers. One of the amazing things about the world at the moment is that I can have the wisest and best teachers of mindfulness against depression, psychotherapy, ecology. I can have them in my own room and the price is just ridiculously reasonable. So thank you. So uh, any last tip, top tip, uh, Ruby, for being embodied in this 21st century? Uh, I use other people because that is, <laughs> You know, if you don't do mindfulness, look into somebody's eyes and maybe a few more people. And then, you know, it turns on that same warmth that you would get working on your own, looking at other people straight in the eye. So maybe that's a good moment to sort of uh, look into the screen, sort mm. of just take those people in. Yeah. And see, Ruby, it's been a joy and a delight to meet you. Thank you. And uh, if I'm ever at a conference with you again, I'll say hello. At, oh, definitely. Uh, <laughs> Unless Dan Siegel is there and then I won't notice you. <laughs> yep, true. Okay. <laughs> I can't compete. <laughs> okay. Thank so thank you. And uh, don't forget Ruby's book and the Frazzled Cafe. Uh, so you can find out about those. Mm -hmm.